Okay, so this graph, this slide is from lecture nine, I believe, and I want to talk about it because I think it will help you understand um, worksheet five. Okay, ligand binding curve, KD. So we're going to be talking about KD a lot. What is KD? KD is equivalent to the molar concentration of ligand at which half of the available ligand binding sites are occupied. So we're going to be talking about an enzyme or a protein, and we're going to be talking about ligands. So ligands are what bind to the enzyme, and an enzyme can have many binding sites, or there could be lots of enzymes that the enzyme that the ligands can bind with. So the KD is the molar concentration of ligand at which half of the available binding sites are occupied. So Y represents that. How many binding sites are occupied out of the total amount? So if there's 100 binding sites total and 50 of them are occupied, then that would be 50 out of 100. And that would be Y's value. Y would be 0 0.5. So on the Y axis here, we have Y. And then when Y is equal to 0 0.5, that's how we can find the KD value for each uh, ligand or for each protein. So on the bottom, we just have the concentration. So we have protein A and we have protein B. Which of the, these two proteins has a greater affinity? Okay, so all we do is we go to where y is equal to 0 0.5 and we draw a line across. Okay, and for protein A, you see that it, you just draw the line straight down and you see that at 2, at a concentration of 2, it has already filled half of the binding sites. Whereas B, if you draw the line down, it takes six at a concentration of six. That's when it would fill half of the binding sites. So that would mean that, and then that's the KD value. So for A, the KD value is two micromolar, and for B, the KD value is six micromolar. So whoever has the lowest KD value has the highest affinity, okay? And then I put the explanations here and here. Okay, for question one, I'm gonna start off with some definitions. In our bodies, proteins, enzymes, have to be able to bind to their ligand, but they also have to be able to release it when the time is right. For example, Pizza Hut, that's where I get my pizza from. My driver has to be able to pick up my pizza, hang onto it tightly, and then hand it over when he reaches my house. And it's the same with enzymes. Um, capital K. That's the equilibrium constant. A lowercase k is the rate constant. So capital K, lowercase k. Equilibrium constant, rate constant. In this case, capital Ka is an association constant. Don't get this confused with the acid dissociation constant. We left that behind. Right now we're talking about an association constant. And we're just talking about an enzyme and how it associates with its ligand. For example, if we have an enzyme here and it has a little notch and another little notch and another little notch. Okay, we have that enzyme and it associates with its ligand. So this could be like one ligand, another ligand, and another ligand. Okay, to perform a function. So that's what the association constant is talking about. So Ka capital is the equilibrium between the complex and the unbound components. So what is the complex? The complex is just when the enzyme is attached to the ligands. Um, the higher the Ka, or the association constant, the equilibrium constant, 
the greater the affinity that the ligand has for that protein. When a protein and its ligand bind, that's the Ka association constant, and it's in molarity. Now we're talking about a little k and the A. So that's the association rate. So I uh, color-coded these for you. Uh, equilibrium constants um, in yellow and the rate constants are in blue. So the little ka is the association rate. So it's a second order reaction and uh, this, these are the units per mole, per molarity per um, second. And so it's a second order reaction because you're starting with a protein plus the ligand. So you're starting with two items. So that's why. And then KD is just the dissociation constant. So when a protein and its ligand separate or dissociate, KD is equal to 1 over the KA. So the KA that we were talking about over here, the association complex, um, 1 divided by the KA is equal to the KD. Now the, the ligand concentration at which half of the available ligand binding sites are occupied is equal to 1 over Ka or the Kd because the Kd is equal to 1 over Ka. For 90% of the ligand binding sites to be occupied, the ligand concentration has to be 9 times higher than the Kd value. The smaller the Kd, the greater the affinity. So the smaller the dissociation constant, the greater the affinity. Kd is equivalent to the molar concentration of ligand at which half of the available ligand binding sites are occupied. Okay, so if there's 100 binding sites, when 50 of them are occupied, that's half of them, that's your Kd. Okay, now we're talking about the small Kd and that's the dissociation rate. That's a first order reaction. The units are per second. And it's a first order reaction because you have one term in the beginning and it's protein plus ligand. So this is just the bound complex of protein and ligand. You're starting off with one term and that's why it's a first order reaction. Under physiological conditions, the concentration of the ligand is a lot higher than the binding sites. We're always going to have a lot more ligand. Um, and then Y is equal to the binding sites occupied divided by the total binding sites. So if you have 50 binding sites that are occupied out of 100 total, it's just 50 divided by 100. Okay, question one. One protein binds four ligands, A through D. Based on the following information, which ligand binds the tightest to that protein? So when they're asking about a ligand that binds tightly, they're just asking about affinity. And remember that the lower the KD value, the higher the affinity. So we just have to do the math for all four of these, and then we put them in order um, from highest to smallest or smallest to highest. And then we just know that the smallest value for KD that's going to be our answer. It's going to have the strongest affinity. So for A, the ligand A with a KD of 10 to the negative 9 molarity. So here we don't have to do any math. They literally gave us the KD value. Okay, so the KD value is equal to 10 to the negative 9 molarity. Ligand B with a KD is equal 10 to the negative 3 molarity. Okay, so they gave us two values. Ligand C with a percent occupancy of 30% at 1 micromolar. So we have to do the math there. And D, ligand D, with a percent occupancy of 80% at 10 nanomolar. Okay, so here they're kind of trying to trick you. Make sure you pay attention. Micromolar, that's 10 to the negative 6. And nanomolar, that's 10 to the negative 9. Okay, so we're going to do C first, so I'm just going to write down C here, and let's see, 
So for C, they gave us percent occupancy of 30% at one micromolar. So we just plug that into this formula here. Um, so we have 0 0.3. So 30% is the same as 0 0.3. Okay, is equal to, okay, and on top we have the ligand concentration. <clears throat> okay, and it's super easy to convert. So they gave us one micromolar. So remember micro just means 10 to the negative 6. So you just do 1 times 10 to the negative 6 molarity. It's that easy. Over, and again, at the bottom you have the ligand concentration. So you just write that again. 1 times 10 to the minus 6 molarity. plus the KD value. So you had all the information, and all you have to do is rearrange everything to get your KD value. Okay, so you just multiply this number by, where is it? Okay, this number by 0 0.3, and then you multiply the KD by 0 0.3. So when you multiply 0 0.3 times 1 times 10 to the negative 6 molarity, you get 3 times 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity. plus, and then 0 0.3 KD. Okay. So the whole point of that was just to remove these guys from the bottom. So then you just set that equal to one, whatever you had on, on top here, just it's still there. One times 10 to the negative six molarity. So this is a 10, not a six, 10, okay. Okay, so when you work out the math here, KD is equal to 2.3 times 10 to the power of negative 6 molarity. Okay, so I wrote that off to the side. Our answer was C is equal to 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6 molarity. And now we have to calculate D. I'm going to do that in white because you can see it better. Okay, so for D, here's the numbers that they gave us. They gave us 80%. So all you do, 80% is 0 0.80. Is equal to okay so we'll just set this up our ligand concentration was 10 nanomolar so remember nano is just 10 to the negative 9 so you just write 10 times 10 to the power of negative 9 molarity And then on the bottom, you have your ligand concentration again.
So you just write that again. Okay, so that's 10 to the negative 9, 10 times 10 to the negative 9 molarity plus the KD at the bottom. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing. We need to get these numbers in the denominator up here, so we multiply them by the 0.80. Okay, so 10 times 10 to the negative 9 times 0.80 is equal to... Okay, so I'm going to let you do those calculations by yourself based on how we did C. And then so your KD, your answer should be 2.5 times 10 to the negative 9 molarity. Okay, so which of these has a smaller KD value? Um, let me highlight it in red. Let's use yellow. Okay, so for C it was 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6. Okay, negative 6 molarity. For D it was 2.5 times 10 to the negative 9 molarity. Okay, for A it was 10 to the negative 9 molarity. And for B, it was 10 to the negative 3 molarity. Remember, the higher the, the power in the negative direction, then the smaller the actual number. So here, minus 3 is actually a larger number. Minus 6 is the next larger number. And then you have your minus 9s. For A, you don't have anything in front of the 10. It's just 10 to the negative 9. And for D, you have 2.5 times this value. So D, the value for D, is actually larger than the value for A. So then ligand A has the smallest KD value, which means that it has the greatest affinity. Okay, problem two. Reversible ligand binding. Three membrane receptor proteins bind tightly to a hormone. Based on the data in the table below, A, what is the KD for hormone binding by protein 2? Include the approximate units. Okay, let's go ahead and highlight that. They are interested in protein 2. This one right here. Okay, and B, which of these proteins binds the most tightly to the hormone? Let's look at this table first. So on the left, we have a hormone concentration in nanomolar. Remember, that's just 10 to the negative 9 moles per liter. Okay, so we have a 0 0.2 uh, nanomoles per liter, 0 0.5 nanomoles per liter, 1 nanomoles per liter, 4, 10, 20, and 50 nanomoles per liter. So you start off with a really low concentration of the hormone, and then you go up to a really high concentration of the hormone. On the right hand side you have protein 1, protein 2, and protein 3. And what they've given you are the values for Y. So I brought over the definition for Y. Y is just the binding sites that are occupied divided by the total binding sites. So for example, if you have 100 binding sites occupied, you would divide that by however many binding sites you have total. So at this point, you have all of the binding sites occupied. That's 100 divided by 100, so your Y would equal 1. That means that all of your binding sites are occupied when your Y is equal to 1. So let's say that you have 50 of your binding, site, binding sites occupied, and there's 100 total. So your Y value would just equal to 0.5. Down here we have the definition for KD. KD is the equivalent to the molar concentration of ligand at which half of the available ligand binding sites are occupied. So half of the binding sites are occupied. So this is what they're talking about. So when they're, when the Y value is equal to 0 0.5 for any one of those proteins, you look at that concentration, that molar concentration. So they want it in moles per liter or molarity. Um, and then that's equal to your KD. So for A, they said, what is the KD for the hormone binding by protein 2? So protein 2 
we find the value at which y is equal to 0 0.5 and we follow that to get the molar concentration. So it just happens that the molar concentration is 0 0.5 nanomolar. So this is our KD value. The KD value is 0 0.5 nanomolar for protein 2. Which of these proteins binds most tightly to this hormone? Okay, so remember that Y is equal to the number of sites occupied divided by the total binding sites. So you are looking for the protein that has the highest Y values for, for these relative concentrations. So let's start off with the first concentration, 0 0.2 nanomolar. If we go to pro protein 1, the Y value is 0 0.048. Protein 2, it's 0 0.29. So protein 2, the Y value is higher than the Y value for protein 1. And then if we go to protein 3, it's 0 0.17. So protein 2 has a higher Y value than the other two proteins. And that means that it has more binding sites that are occupied relative to the other two proteins. Let's look at the this 10 concentration. Okay, for protein 1, it's 0.71. For protein 2, it is 0.95, and for protein 3, it is 0.91. Again, protein 2 has a higher Y value, so there's more, more ligand bound to the protein. So that's it. Um, that's how you know that, and, and you can keep checking all of them. 0 0.933, 0 0.99, 0 0.98. So that's how you know that protein 2 has a higher affinity to the hormone because its Y value is always higher. Okay, hemoglobin has three ligands, hydrogen ion, CO2, and BPG. BPG is bisphosphoglycerate. So I will talk about these three later, um, but here I wanted to include this extra slide to be a little bit more specific. And these figures are from lecture. So in this first graph, you see that on the y-axis we have y, which is how many ligand binding sites are filled out of uh, how many total, so the fraction. And here we have 50% of the ligand binding sites that are filled. On the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in kilopascals. Okay, so we have three curves with different pHs, pH of 7.2, pH of 7.4, and pH of 7.6. Now remember that the closer, so with your 0.5y, you draw it across, and to find the KD value, you just follow from where the line is, where it crosses, all the way down. So that would be your KD value for that line. This would be your KD value for this line. And this would be your KD value for this line. The lower the KD value, the higher the affinity. Okay, so we're going to start off with a pH of 7.2 down here. Let me use my laser. So at a pH of 7.2, this means that the pH is low because we only have 7.2, 7.4, and 7.6. So we're looking at the lower end of the spectrum. A lower pH is more acidic. This means that there are more hydrogen ions. I guess the hydrogen got cut off. That's supposed to be a hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ions in solution. So lower pH means more acidic, more hydrogen ions in solution. So more protons in solution means that they will bind to hemoglobin. When protons bind hemoglobin, its binding affinity for oxygen decreases. When its affinity for oxygen decreases, it will let go of the oxygen. This will make the tissues happy because they were running low on oxygen. So remember, at the tissues, every single cell needs oxygen or else it will die. So this is great. This is a great system that our bodies have for um, releasing oxygen. Um, with the lower pH, more acidic, more hydrogens. When hydrogen uh, binds 
uh, hemoglobin, then hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases and it releases the oxygen. Okay, so add a pH of 7.6, so now we're at a high pH. The pH is higher, which means that it is more basic. There are less hydrogen ions in solution, so they will not bind to hemoglobin. This means that hemoglobin will have a higher binding affinity for oxygen, so it will pick up oxygen. And that's good, because in the lungs we're breathing all that oxygen and we want hemoglobin to pick it up, so that makes sense. And now we're going to talk about CO2. In the tissues, CO2 concentration is high. So CO2 binds to hemoglobin, forming salt bridges that stabilize the T state. So hemoglobin releases oxygen. Again, that's good. Um, in the lungs, oxygen concentration is high. So this promotes binding of oxygen and it releases CO2, okay? So, and then for bisphosphoglycerate, it's really small here and I can't make this larger, but basically bisphosphoglycerate fits right there in the middle and it creates electrostatic interactions between, um, between, between bisphosphoglycerate and amino acids um, between the beta subunits. So the way that that works is that BPG is super negatively charged. So it connects with positively charged amino acids and that's how it forms those electrostatic interactions. And you can only have one BPG at a time and BPG stabilizes the T state. And remember the T state um, doesn't really like oxygen to bind. The R state is the one that stabilizes um, when oxygen is present. So BPG stabilizes the T state where oxygen is not present. The transition to the R state narrows the binding pocket for BPG and it doesn't let BPG in. So BPG is negatively charged. It forms uh, interactions with positively charged ions between the beta subunits of hemoglobin and it stabilizes the T state so there's no oxygen. Okay, so what we've learned from this as a summary is just that anytime one of the ligand partners, the ligand binding partners of hemoglobin binds, then the uh, oxygen affinity of hemoglobin decreases. Number three, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. What is the effect of the following changes on the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin? So what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is a protein that has four subunits. Let's see, here we go. Four subunits, each with a heme group. It exists in red blood cells, and its function is to carry oxygen to all the cells in the body. In arteries, hemoglobin is 96% saturated with oxygen. In the veins, hemoglobin is 64% saturated. Adult hemoglobin has two alpha chains, alpha 1 and alpha 2, and two beta chains, beta 1 and beta 2. Mm, let's see. Hemoglobin has two conformational states, the R state and the T state. The R state. Oxygen has a higher affinity for hemoglobin in the R state. In the T state, oxygen has a lower affinity for hemoglobin. In the T state. Hemoglobin has three ligands, hydrogen ion, carbon dioxide, and BPG. When one of the ligands bind, the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin decreases. The oxygen saturation curve shifts to the right. pH when the pH decreases, so does the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. Partial pressure of CO2 in the lungs. When the partial pressure of CO2 decreases, the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin increases. BPG. When BPG levels decrease, 
the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin increase. Carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. An increase in carbon monoxide in the atmosphere will decrease the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. Okay, so A. Actually, I think we answered all of these questions. Yeah, we answered all of these questions. I just added a little bit of background information to help you understand things a little more. Hemoglobin variants. There are almost 500 naturally occurring variants of hemoglobin. Most are the result of a single amino acid substitution in a globin polypeptide chain. Some variants produce clinical illness, though not all variants have deleterious effects. A brief sample follows. Okay, HBS is sickle cell hemoglobin. Here you substitute a valine for a glutamic acid on the surface. So if you remember, valine is nonpolar and glutamic acid has a negative charge. So that's not good. Um, HB Cowtown eliminates an ion pair involved in T state stabilization. That's not good. Um, HB Memphis substitutes one uncharged polar residue for another of similar size on the first surface. So if it replaces it with another one that's also polar and about the same size, then it won't make too much of a difference. HB Biba substitutes a proline for a leucine involved in an alpha helix. What do we know about proline and alpha helices? Um, okay, HB Milwaukee substitutes a glutamine, no, glutamic acid for a valine. Again, negatively charged and valine is nonpolar. HB Providence substitutes an asparagine, which is polar, for a lysine, which is positively charged, that normally projects into the central cavity of the tetramer. HB Philly substitutes a phenylalanine for a tyrosine, disrupting hydrogen bonding at the alpha-1, beta-1 interface. A, which HB variants least above is likely, oh yeah, okay, so they, they wrote that wrong on the um, worksheet. So they're asking which HB variant is from above is least likely, is, let me write in white, is least Okay, which variant from above is least likely to cause pathological symptoms? Okay, so the answer here for A is HB Memphis because it substitutes one uncharged polar residue for another uncharged polar residue of the same size. So the difference is a conservative one so it won't really affect or cause pathological symptoms, or at least it's the least likely to do that. Um, B, which HB variant least above is most likely? Okay, again, the same thing. Um, which HB variant from above is most likely to show PI values different from that of HBA on an isoelectric focusing gel. Okay, so this question sounds complicated, but it's really easy. It has to do with charge. So any of the guys up there that have been, that have changed the charge, those are going to affect what you'll see like the PI. So in this case, we have HBS, you know, the first one, valine is uh, nonpolar glutamic acid is negative charge. So that's a huge difference. That's going to affect the PI. Um, what else? HB Milwaukee. Okay. So that one is glutamic acid, which is negatively charged for valine, which is nonpolar. So that's going to affect the PI. 
and then we have HB Providence. Asparagine is polar, but it's not charged. And lysine is positively charged, so that'll change the PI. Mm, let's see. HB Cowtown eliminates an ion pair. Okay, so that ion pair that could possibly um, result in the loss of a charged residue. And if that's the case, then that will also um, modify the PI, but we don't have enough information here, so we're not gonna add that. C, hemoglobin Chesapeake, described by Shirash, Weatherall and Chegg in 1966, is a hemoglobin variant in which a lysine, remember lysine is positively charged, residue is substituted for arginine, which is also positively charged, at residue 92 of an alpha chain. This mutation stabilizes the R state. Which of the following three graphs could represent hemoglobin? Chesapeake's dissociation curve. So they told us that the, the mutation stabilizes the R state. Okay, a couple of things you should have memorized. When the R state is stabilized, or the T state is destabilized, the hemoglobin has an increased affinity for oxygen. When the R state is stabilized, or the T state is destabilized, the hemoglobin has an increased affinity for oxygen. And here, that's the case we we're given. Um, the R state is stabilized. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the three graphs. Um, on the y-axis, we have the fraction, the fractional saturation from 0.2 to 1. And then on the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in TOR. Okay, so they're asking you which of each these graphs represents this mutation that stabilizes the R state. So graph C is the correct answer because you can see that the arrow is going back this way from the normal hemoglobin to the red curve, which shows that there's a higher uh, fractional saturation of oxygen at a lower partial pressure of oxygen. The studies of oxygen transport in pregnant mammals show that the oxygen saturation curves of fetal hemoglo hemoglobin, that's HBF, and maternal hemoglobin, that's HBA, are markedly different when measured under the same conditions. Which hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen at the tissue? Partial pressure of oxygen of around four kilopascals. So again, on the y-axis, we have the oxygen saturation. And on the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in kilopascals. So they're asking at four kilopascals, right here. They're saying who has the higher affinity for oxygen here. And so this is the mom's HBA, and this is the fetal HBF. Okay, so here we can see that if you go all the way up, let's see who is saturated to what amount. So the line is crossed here. So you just go across, and this is about 60%. For the mother's hemoglobin is about 60% saturated. Um, and for the fetal hemoglobin, you go all the way across. Whoops, it's supposed to be like up here. And it's about 90%, maybe more than 90%. So fetal hemoglobin has a higher oxygen, affinity for oxygen at the tissue, partial pressure of oxygen, which is about four kilopascals. It's that easy. Number five, sickle cell anemia. The mutated form of hemoglobin, hemoglobin S or HBS, in sickle cell anemia results from the replacement of a glutamate residue, remember that's negatively charged, by a valine. So there was supposed to be a glutamate with a negative charge, but instead it gets replaced with a valine that has a 
it's a nonpolar. There's no charge. Um, residue at position six in the beta chain. Let's see it. Position six in the beta chain. <clears throat> and of the protein. Under conditions of low oxygen concentration, HBS aggregates and it distorts the red blood cell into a sickle shape. Sickled red blood cells are relatively inflexible and may clog capillary beds, causing pain and tissue damage. The sickled red blood cells also have a shorter lifespan, leading to anemia. A. Why does the replacement of glutamic acid by valine at position 6 cause aggregation of HBS? Okay, so we're going to say this is position 6, and you're supposed to have glutamic acid with a negative charge, but instead you have valine. So valine is nonpolar. And another word for nonpolar is hydrophobic. So nonpolar. And so that is hydrophobic. So what happens here is that this hydrophobic valine becomes a sticky, a sticky end. So this position six is normally located on the beta chain of the outside of the molecule. And remember, any of the side chains that come towards, that face the outside of the molecule either have to be polar or they have to be charged, like a positive charge or a negative charge. So in this case, let's say this was position six and it had a negative charge. Now this valine that is hydrophobic is stuck on the outside of the molecule facing the polar uh, water. So that's why it's a, it creates like a, a problem and it's a, a hydrophobic sticky valine. So what ends up happening is that you get several of these guys and at position six they all have that hydrophobic valine and they're sticky so they end up associating with each other and that is how they end up forming these aggregates, these fibrous aggregates and that is why we have disease because this is not supposed to happen, okay? B, determine if the glutamic acid replacement by other amino acids listed below would likely cause a sickle cell anemia. Alanine, let's see if the glutamic, okay, so here they're talking about, it looks like they're talking about position six as well. So it was supposed to be glutamic acid and now they're giving you these uh, five amino acid residues that you're gonna replace. And then you have to figure out if you're gonna get a disease or not. Okay, so we're gonna start off with alanine. So alanine is nonpolar, just like valine was, and it's also hydrophobic. So with alanine, the answer is yes, you will get this same kind of sickle cell disease. You're going to have a fibrous aggregate because of that. Um, with aspartic acid or aspartate, um, the charge is negative. Let me write it down over here. Uh, the charge will be negative for aspartate. And it was negative for glutamic acid. So no, there's no, you don't get any disease. They're the same. Okay, and then for leucine, leucine is nonpolar. So you're dealing with the same issue as you were with valine and alanine, nonpolar, hydrophobic. So yes, you would end up with a sickle cell disease. And then lysine, 
lysine has a positive charge and so let's look at this one here let's say that this is position six and you have a positive charge and remember that this is on the outside of the molecule so this positive charge is facing the water remember what you want facing the water is polar and charged molecules they can be positively charged or negatively charged so in this case no with the lysine substitution there will not be a sickle cell um, aggregation this way that only happens when there is a nonpolar hydrophobic amino acid stuck on the outside okay so then we have arginine arginine is positively charged and it's the same thing as lysine no we don't get disease okay before question six i wanted to talk about this slide from lecture cooperative binding of hemoglobin hemoglobin must bind oxygen efficiently in the lungs where the partial pressure of oxygen is about 13.3 kilopascals and it's got to release oxygen in the tissues where the partial pressure of oxygen is four kilopascals remember the tissues the cells in the tissues will die without oxygen and there's less oxygen in the tissues that's why the partial pressure of oxygen is only four kilopascals where in the lungs we're breathing it in freshly so that's why we have such a large partial pressure of oxygen of 13.3 kilopascals in the lungs so what is cooperative binding this is a concept that students really struggle with so this is when remember that hemoglobin has four subunits okay two alphas and two betas inside of each subunit is one heme group and inside of the heme groups is where the oxygen is bound so does it happen that all four oxygens bind at the same exact time no what happens it's that it's cooperatively binded and that means that you start off in the t state which means that there's no oxygen and then the very first oxygen binds okay so i'm going to put o2 the very first oxygen molecule binds and remember in the t state there's uh electrostatic interactions happening positive and negative charges stabilizing the t state but those begin to break when the first oxygen binds and then you begin your transition into the r state which is where those interactions are no longer happening so the next group can then uh, bind the oxygen a little faster and then the third group and then the fourth group so that's cooperative binding so i'm just going to read it to you the first molecule of oxygen binds weakly to a subunit in the t-state its binding leads to conformational changes that are communicated to adjacent subunits making it easier for additional mo molecules of oxygen to bind the t to r transition occurs oxygen molecules bind with much higher affinity than the first molecule of oxygen so that's what they mean by cooperative binding the first molecule will bind with low affinity and as more molecules of oxygen bind they will do so with a greater affinity okay so here on the graph we have uh, the sigmoid binding curve of hemoglobin so they just mean this right here okay and uh, that's how we want it to be we want oxygen to bind in a sigmoidal way um, so this curve down here is the low affinity state um, so that's the t the t conformation for hemoglobin remember there's those uh, those uh, cross-linking that is happening with the the electrostatic interactions from the amino acids how some are positively charged and some are negatively charged and they're attracted to each other uh, so they kind of close up the opening so that oxygen can't bind so that's the t state low affinity and then up here we have the r state and that's high affinity um, 
so those interactions are broken and oxygen can bind. Um, and then in the middle is a sigmoidal. So we want it to be sigmoidal because right here in the lungs, we want oxygen to bind quickly. Okay, we want the affinity to be super strong, which it is. But as we go into the tissues, we don't want oxygen to bind with high affinity, right? We want oxygen to be released to the tissues. Kind of like the example of the pizza that I gave earlier. When I order a pizza, my driver has to pick it up and hang on to it tightly, just like here in the lungs. But when he arrives to my house, he has to let it go, okay? He has to hand it over. Otherwise, I'll starve. And that's how that works. Problem number six, cooperativity and hemoglobin. Under appropriate conditions, hemoglobin dissociates into its four subunits. The isolated alpha subunits bind oxygen but the oxygen saturation curve is hyperbolic rather than sigmoidal. In addition, the binding of oxygen to the isolated alpha subunit is not affected by the presence of hydrogen ion, carbon dioxide, or BPG. A, draw the expected oxygen binding curves for the tetrameric heap, let's write in what? for the tetrameric hemoglobin and for isolated alpha subunit. Okay, so here on the y-axis we have percent of occupied sites or percent saturation, so that's why. Um, remember that we always do the 0 0.5 of y, so I'll just draw my line. That's how I do it because it helps me. And whenever you see a curve, you always want to go straight down where the line crosses the curve. And that's the <clears throat> KD value. And then that's that value there, too. Okay, so draw the tetrameric hemoglobin and the isolated alpha subunit. So all they're talking about here is that, remember, oh, let me write in white. Okay, so remember that hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein so it's got the four subunits and they're all stuck together um, but what they're saying is that sometimes you can have the isolated alpha units only because remember you have alpha alpha beta beta two betas and two alphas so they're saying that sometimes you can just have the alpha unit by itself okay and so they want you to draw draw them on this graph. So the tetramer is the solid line. So remember that hemoglobin, that's the tetramer, and it has a sigmoidal curve, and that's what we want, okay? And then so for the individual, you have the dashed line. So it's not really a sigmoidal curve. It's more hyperbolic, okay? How can you explain their different behavior? Okay, so I'm gonna read the answer from the key. These observations indicate that the cooperative behavior, the sigmoid oxygen binding curve, and the positive cooperativity and ligand binding of hemoglobin arises from the interactions between subunits. So remember that we wanted the sigmoid the curve to be sigmoidal. Why? Because you want to be able to have strong binding and pick up the oxygen in the lungs, but we want to have less strong binding as you get to the tissues so that you can release the oxygen. But when you have the alpha subunit by itself here in this uh, dashed line, you, you have like a really steep slope the whole time. Um, so that's not good. That would be like a a pizza delivery driver picking up my pizza coming to drop it off and then saying you know what never mind I'm just gonna keep it and then taking off again <laughs> so um, and then so you're also seeing that the sigmoidal curve is only happening when you have the tetramer so that's showing that the interaction between the subunits is what is causing this behavior so there was also uh, a figure in lecture nine that the professor presented where she kind of split this up and said, okay, the, 
the slope here is 1, and then here in the middle the slope is 3, and then over here the slope is 1. C. What would you expect Hill coefficient n to be for tetrameric hemoglobin and for the isolated subunit? And what is the meaning of Hill coefficient? Okay, so the Hill coefficient provides information about the cooperativity of the subunits in an allosteric protein. So it's just their cooperativity. It's like, okay, after the first one binds, does that increase? Uh, the binding affinity of the next ones, or do they all bind at the same time and there's no cooperativity, or are they independent from each other? One binds and then that's it, or sometimes you can have two binding and then that's it. That would mean that there's no cooperativity, but in hemoglobin, we know that there is cooperativity, and when one binds weakly, the next ones bind more strongly. Um, so that is what the Hill coefficient is measuring. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what should the Hill coefficient be? So the professor explained in class that it should be, it's kind of like based on the number of subunits. So with myoglobin, there's only one subunit and the Hill coefficient is one. So for the alpha subunit, there's only one, so it should be one. Um, for this hemoglobin tetramer, it, there's four subunits, so the Hill coefficient could be n equals four. But as she explained in lecture, um, you normally don't have like 100%. So the Hill coefficient is three based on experiments that have been performed in the lab. For problem number seven, characteristics of hemoglobin and myoglobin. Identify each statement about myoglobin and hemoglobin as true or false. A, each hemoglobin or myoglobin molecule can bind four oxygen molecules. Okay, we know that's false because myoglobin can only bind one and hemoglobin can bind four. The oxygen dissociation curve for myoglobin is hyperbolic in shape. That's true. Uh, C. Molecular oxygen binds irreversibly to iron 2 plus in heme. That's false. D, each iron atom in hemoglobin or myoglobin can form six coordination bonds, and one of these bonds is formed between iron and oxygen. That's true. Hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than myoglobin. Okay, that's false. Myoglobin has a greater affinity. Uh, F, myoglobin is heterotetramer. Myoglobin is a heterotetramer, whereas hemoglobin is a monomer. That's false. Uh, G, both hemoglobin and myoglobin contain a prosthetic group called a heme group, uh, which contains a central iron atom. That's true. H, by itself, heme is not a good oxygen carrier. It must be part of a larger protein to prevent oxidation of the iron. That's true. I, heme is composed of an organic protoporphyrin component and a metal atom. That's true. J, as oxygen binds to hemoglobin, the shape of the molecule changes, enhancing further oxygen binding. That's true. That's a cooperativity. Uh, K, myoglobin delivers oxygen more, effic more efficiently to tissues than hemoglobin. That's false. L, binding of oxygen to myoglobin is cooperative. Okay, that's false. M, the oxygen dissociation curve for hemoglobin is sigmoidal in shape. That's true. N, carbon monoxide binds to an allosteric site of hemoglobin, lowering oxygen binding affinity. That's false.